Good morning, church. It's a wonderful thing to see so many of you here today on this such a cold day yet. Apparently all of your cars started and um, you are all energized to be here, right? Yeah. All right, good, good. Because that's exactly what we, we are called to be, is a worship full and, and, and full of praise for God. And that in and of itself gives us energy. The Holy Spirit lights our fires. And today we are going to think about what a call by God looks like. And, I mean, I think that we can think of light, and we can think of heat, and we can think of all of the things that energize us, bring us together as community, call together for God's purposes. Just a reminder to please fill out one of the um, attendance cards, those are the white cards in the pink racks, whether you're a visitor or a member, it's how we keep attendance. And if the office staff is looking for me to remember who is here, boy, are they a <laughs> They will be disappointed. So please help us out. You can place those cards in the basket on your way out. In addition, if you have a prayer request for today, please fill out your the blue prayer request card, wave it in the air. One of our ushers will come by and bring that up to the assistant minister so that we can include your request in our prayers. And on the other hand, if you have somebody who would just like to add it to the prayer list for next week, the, the printed bulletin, then you can place that blue card together with your white ones in the same basket on your way out. One of our members, you'll hear her, her name lifted up um, in the prayers today, Verna Young, uh, fell and sustained a couple of broken bones, and so she has been moved, and we have a new address for her. She's still at Garden Spot, but in a separate section. So um, I will lift that up again later, but um, if you would like to send a card, then um, we have a new address, and you can get that by contacting the office. Other than that, I invite you to simply take a deep breath in as our sister minister comes forward and to prepare to begin our worship this morning. God the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the unified Holy Spirit are in this place today, calling us all together for worship and praise. Amen. Please stand as you are able. O oh Lord our God, King of the universe, it is your Holy Spirit that calls us together. It is you who has made us and claimed us. You Lord, are the one who forgives us and redeems us from our sin. We confess that we focus on ourselves, our interests, and the building up of riches and power that are not pleasing to you, and serve only to separate us from other people and from your will for our lives. Forgive, Forgive us, us, we pray, and, and lead us to live for you alone. Help us to see and share the life of your love. Children of God, while we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, our saving grace comes from God's abundant love and forgiveness that come through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Believe in him. Believe in God's grace. Be changed by this transforming love poured out on the cross for your sake and for the sake of the world. Amen. Amen. I now invite you to song. Thank you. 
dialogue. Enlarge our vision to see your power at work in the world. And by your grace, make us heralds of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated and to hear the word of God for you today. saved, 
If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as a first importance what I, in turn, had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. Does the screen light up for them? 
Yeah? And and then they get to they get to see who's calling, right? Yeah. And they can choose to answer or not. Sometimes do they just let it go, especially if they're busy? And then they call the person back later. So there is a light that comes and tells them who is calling for them. What is this? A flashlight. I have one for each of you. You're welcome. See that light? God, today we hear about God calling. That's a funny word. But God calls just like he does on the cell phone, but a little bit differently. He calls people to work for him. We call them disciples. And in the Bible, we read about the disciples. Today, we have some of the names of the disciples, Peter and James and John, but there were many others. Do you know who else is a disciple of Jesus? Any guesses? Do you think your mom and dad are disciples of Jesus? I think they are. Do you know what? You are going to be disciples of Jesus, too. And your grandmother and your grandfather, all the people sitting here, they're all disciples of Jesus because Jesus has called us all to serve him. And we do that in lots of different ways. Now, I saw you this morning helping us to sing. That's one of the ways that you help us to serve Jesus, by helping us to praise and worship Jesus. Did you know that that is a calling? Jesus called you to do that, just like he called your grandpa to do that. And Jesus called all of us, called all of the people here to do different things. Some of them are doctors or nurses or teachers. Some of the people work in offices. Some are policemen and fire workers, right? Firemen and women. Yeah, Jesus, God calls us into different works. And sometimes Jesus calls us into special work right here in the church. Do you know what kind of work we do here in the church besides praise God? We make food to bring to people, to serve people who are hungry. And sometimes we collect money and we give it to people who don't have houses. And your, your grandma helps us with that. She helps us to serve those people. And all the people sitting here help by, by giving us the money. And some of them help those people by teaching them. In the other part of the building, we have a school that meets here now. God called us as a church to open our doors to the children and the families that come in there. God calls us all different ways to serve God. And the calling might not look like a light like that, but Jesus' light shines down on all of us so that we can see where God is calling us to work. So I'm going to give you these that will help you when you are helping us with our music. There you go, shakers. You have those before, right? And we're going to pray now that God bless us and help us to see where God is calling. And in our first lesson today, there was a man called Isaiah. And when God called him to serve God, Isaiah said, Here I am, Lord, send me. So we're going to say that in our prayer today, okay? Will you repeat after me? And let's have everybody else repeat too, so you're not by yourself, right? Let's say, Dear Jesus. Thank you for shining your light on us. Thank you for shining your light on us. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for calling us. Help us to do your work. Help us to do your work. Whenever you are looking for someone to serve your people, help us to answer. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming forward. I hope that you remember that and say yes when God calls you, okay? Okay. You can keep those. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. You're a nice voice.
Amen. So, you all saw me hold up a cell phone today and ask the children about their parents and whether they had cell phones, if they knew what that was, and they were pretty well steeped in what technology looks like and what a cell phone is. So I'm going to ask you as well, how many of you have cell phones? All right, most of us have cell phones. How many of you have a phone at home that has call, uh, a caller ID on it so that it lights up when the phone rings? And whether it's your cell phone or a phone like that, we have a choice. That phone lights up. We have a choice on whether we're going to answer that phone or not. Now, truth be told, there are certain phone numbers Prefixes I never pick up because I know they're going to try to sell me a car warranty. <laughs> but on the other hand, sometimes I don't know who it is, and I think, well, it might be somebody from the church, and so I do pick up. And we always have that choice to make. The screen lights up, or the caller ID lights up, and we have a choice to make on whether we answer, whether we pick up or not. And I want you to keep that thought in your mind. Set it aside here for a moment, but keep that in mind as well as we think about today's lessons. Here in the church, we talk about call or calling, or we say that we are called. We use that word in a very specific way, and very often we use that word when we're talking about a pastor, right, or about a church leader, one who perhaps we voted on. It was almost four years ago that we met here in the sanctuary saw me worship, uh, we worship for the first time, preach, and then voted on whether or not God was telling you to call me to lead the ministries of this congregation, to lead and to work alongside you in those ministries. And so we have a certain understanding of call, and we know that a call, when we use it that way, especially when we're talking about it in church, is something that is God-ordained. So God is calling us, is telling us to do something. Now, our Martin Luther talked about all of us having a calling, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But it's not just pastors who are called, whether we're talking about church work and ministry, or whether we're talking about other areas of our lives. God has a specific intention for each and every one of us, and equips us to answer. Even though very often we might feel too old or too young or too unskilled or too ill-equipped to be called, to answer that call, whatever it is that we are perceiving God is calling us to. And then we wrestle with it. That's what we do. And we're not the first ones to do that. So my friends, the first thing I want to point out is that no matter where you are in your life, no matter how old or young, whether you're still working or retired, whether you've got a young family that you're raising or grandchildren that you're that you're uh, that you're leading along, whether you are very busy or not so busy, God has a calling for you. We are each and every one of us called by God, and so the answer or the question for each and every one of us to answer this morning is, how do we answer God's call? Especially. When, it's often the case, we feel unsure or unable or sometimes even confused about how to do that. How is it that I am going to answer this call of God? Now, I, as your pastor, have been called and ordained as a minister of the Church of Jesus Christ. And so I have certain gifts and abilities and responsibilities by virtue of the role that God has carved out for me here in this place and in the world in general, serving the larger church. Now, as most of you know, and some of you may not, I came to the role of public ministry relatively late in my life. I am now in my 10th year of ordained ministry. And yet, at each stage of my life, I can attest to the fact that God has called me to a particular role and a way of serving her. The same is true for each and every one of you. In those callings of mine, I'm going to keep using that word even though in some of these circumstances they may not quite feel natural, I have been a child of my parents. I had a particular role to play. 
particular way of interacting with them, both when I was a very young child and then as an adult child of parents who were getting older themselves. I am the sister of two siblings. I have been a student many times and in many places in my life, both in formal institutional settings and also in less formal settings and places as well. I am a wife and a mother and a grandmother. And when my children were small, I felt a strong sense and calling to be at home with them, raising them as an at-home mom, even though it wasn't a real popular thing to do at that time, but at the same time to serve in my community and church as a volunteer. So I held several volunteer roles in those years when I was raising my children. I felt that this was where God was calling me to be at that place and point in my life. And my point is that each and every one of us has a calling now. And it may not be the same call that you felt moved to answer when you were younger, and there may yet be another call that God has for you as you get older. But God is always using us, calling us into service in some way, into particular roles. God calls us to do his will in living out our lives for the good of our community, God's family for the sake of our church. And yet, that call not only looks different for each and every one of us through various stages of our lives, but also for each and every one of us, as we talked about the skills and gifts that God gives us, and they're not all the same for each and every one of us. And so prayer and discernment and continually listening for the voice of God and for God's intention in our lives is important in every stage of our lives. It never ends. So in my case, after an extended time of wrestling with God, and I have to share with you that in my estimation, my wrestling was almost as dramatic as Jacob's own wrestling, I answered the call to enter seminary and ultimately to serve in this role of pastor. I don't know how or when or where God will call me next. I firmly, strongly believe that God is continuing to call me right now to serve this congregation to serve this community here in Leola and to, to serve the larger church. But I don't know what that will look like in five years or 10 years or 15 years from now. And as I said, I firmly believe also that God is calling each and every one of you, regardless of the stage of life you're in, to a specific area of serving. Who will go for us, God asks in the scriptures today. Well, during the 7th and 8th centuries before Christ, it was Isaiah who identifies himself as a person of unclean lips who does some wrestling of his own. And yet he answers God's call by saying, Here I am, send me. Isaiah then, the one who feels so unskilled, unprepared, really does not feel up to the, the level of being called by God does not feel worthy of it. And yet, even today, we recognize him as one of the major prophets of the church, one of the major prophets of Israel. And even for those of us who are Christians, it is Isaiah's writings that we often turn to, to find the predictions about the one who would come for the sake of God, for the sake of the ultimate salvation of all the world. He is the one whose words very often point us to the coming of Jesus Christ our Lord as our Messiah. Now Paul was a Roman, and he was a zealous persecutor of the followers of Jesus Christ until some dramatic wrestling with God found him blinded and totally vulnerable and at the mercy of others. Part of Paul's conversation or conversion story is that he was knocked down from a horse, where he lay in the dust and the dirt. And I wonder if this part of his story is symbolic of the humbling that must take place before we can answer the call of God. In order to move us from here to there so that we can answer, I wonder if at times we too aren't knocked from our metaphorical horses. The means by which we elevate ourselves in life, very often leaving little room for a call. 
So I wonder if that being not from the horse is the way that we can find our way to a positive response to God's call for us. Paul's call was to serve as a missionary for the Church of Christ and to spread the good news of the gospel, not among Jews, but among Gentiles. He was called to expand to the church and to make it clear that God's expansive view was not only for the children of Israel, but for all of us. And because of the call that he received and answered, he was persecuted, imprisoned, and ultimately died for the sake of Jesus. And yet even today, it is his words that we in the church often look to for instruction on how to follow Jesus, on how to serve as disciples of Jesus Christ, how to be church together. Now Jesus stands on the shore of the Lake of Gennesaret, also known to us by the names of the Sea of Galilee and the Sea of Tiberias. All three names refer to the same body of water, and that's where Jesus is sharing the word of God, sharing the stories of God's love and mercy, telling all who are gathered there. And that crowd is growing because people need to hear about this love, need to hear about this mercy. Nearby, Simon Peter and others who made their living as fishermen are working. Now, as a number of those people, that growing crowd grows to the point where Jesus is being pressed in and, and kind of forced to the shores of the water, where the water is meeting the sand, rather than sending those people away, knowing how much they need to hear about God's love and God's mercy. Jesus goes to the fishermen and asks if he can be put out a little way so that he can sit in the boat and continue his teaching, continue to share that good news to the people who are gathered there. And the fishermen, Simon Peter in particular, comply. And from that boat, Jesus indeed continues to tell the people about God. And we all know what happens next because this story is a familiar story to us and is very often entitled or referred to as the call of the disciples, the call story of the disciples. Where Jesus calls disciples who will work closely with him, who will learn from him, continue to serve him and to serve the world that God so dearly loves. How do we interpret the meaning of the details in the story, however? After Jesus finishes speaking to the crowd and they disperse, despite his protestations, Simon Peter finally concedes to taking Jesus out into the deeper water. Now he knows that he and the other fishermen have been fishing all night. They've come up with nada, nothing, zero, zip. And he expects, he is certain, that the same is going to happen when he follows Jesus' instructions. But he says, okay, okay, we'll do as you ask. We will go, we'll go out into deeper water. Even though we know there's no hope for fishing this time of day, no fish to be caught anyway, he hauls off his ropes and his nets, those things that he was cleaning, and he follows Jesus' instruction. And then what happens? Miraculous thing, right? The nets are full. They are so full, he has to call another boat open. Those nets are more full than they have ever seen them before. The hull is greater than they have ever experienced before. Their certainty is put on the sideline. Oh my goodness, what is happening here? Peter follows Jesus' instruction, and this miraculous thing that he is certain could never happen, indeed happens. As those fish, too numerous to count, are gathered in the nets. And you know, it wasn't until he listened to Jesus and obeyed him, followed Jesus' instructions, leaving behind his certainty, to a certain degree, that Simon Peter could make progress. Even though he doubted Jesus and his ideas about what they should do, that, that miraculous catch became reality only because Peter followed Jesus, followed his command, and obeyed. Last year, a particularly rare and weird and 
and wonderful creature washed up on a California beach. Now there are lots of weird and rare and wonderful creatures that exist on our planet and we are absolutely unaware, ignorant of many of them. And most of you are probably unlikely aware of this deep sea monster as I am unless you happen to have little ones and did a great deal of watching Disney's movie Finding Nemo where you might have met this creature called the Pacific Football Fish because he tried to make a meal out of Marley and Marlin and Dory. When you saw that fish, you might have thought it was a mystical creature, something not real but the product of a creative mind. But it turns out that this fearsome looking ocean dweller, rarely seen, is in fact real. Now this is uh, an illustration of it. The real thing is far uglier. But the point is that this indeed exists. Now, it was first discovered about 100 years ago, and in this intervening years, about 31 of them have washed ashore and actually been seen. They have a very broad range, but the reason that we don't see them is that they usually exist in the very deepest parts of the ocean, sometimes as far down as 3,300 feet, where human beings don't go. And so while about three of these fish have washed ashore in just the year 2021, we don't know why, the last that was seen before that was about 20 years ago. The football fish, as you can see it here, has this, well, let's just say it's really interesting all by itself, and it follows its own lead, and it has this funny-looking protrusion, I don't know if you can see it, the lights dim that picture a little bit, but there's a funny looking protrusion coming out of the top of its head. And the very tip of it has a little bulb there that has a bioluminescence to it, partly because of the bacteria that gathers there. And so you could say that this curious fish shines its own light. It makes its own light. Living at a depth of the ocean where light would not be able to penetrate from above, it seems like this ability to shine light in its own world would help it navigate too, doesn't it? Yeah, we think that. After all, who needs light from above when you can produce your own light? And I wonder, as we think about this, if we too don't sometimes use our own light whether that light looks like our abilities or our intelligence or our wealth, knowledge, skill, whatever it is, to attract other people our way, to shine light on our environment. We don't have to depend on other light when we have our own light that we can shine. But the question is, when is our own certainty the thing that guides our thoughts and our decisions, including those that rule out interactions with others? or even our purpose in the world, the purpose to which God is calling us. When is our own certainty and the light that we create from it the thing that we follow? Because the thing is that when we are following our own light, we can be blinded to that light that comes from above, that light that is Jesus Christ, that light that God shines down into our world, into our hearts, calling us, and shining the light so that we can see exactly what God is calling us to and exactly how to get there. Isaiah, Paul, and Simon Peter were doing just that. They didn't know any better. They were following their own light. But God had plans for them. And in order to follow God, in order to obey Jesus, for those who come after Jesus' birth, life, and death. In order to see the light that God sends into the world, there was a lot of wrestling that took place for each and every one of them. They wrestled with the things that they were certain of, the things that they could see by virtue of the light that they shone into the world. Through their individual wrestling then, Isaiah's guilt and sin were blotted out and he was called to prophesy for God. Paul was renamed from Saul after being knocked from his horse and his own sense of certainty. And he came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. And then he was called to grow the church among the Gentiles. And Simon Peter, James, and John, well, they were all called to follow Jesus too and to work with him, to learn at the feet of our Savior. 
Because no matter where you are in life, God, through the love of Jesus, can and does call. And God is calling you through Jesus Christ. And God is blessing you with God's own purpose. The question I think that each of us needs to ask is what is the horse from which we need to fall in order to answer as Isaiah did? Here I am, Lord. Use me. Send me. Shine your light on me and then let me share that light with others. Indeed, God is calling you for a purpose. And just like Isaiah and Paul and James and John and Simon Peter, there are things that we need to leave behind in order to follow Jesus. That self created certainty, that self created light. While the call of God places us and our lives on a certain path, God places us and gives us a life in which we can serve. And while that call and that service may challenge us at first, God provides all the light that we need. All the light that we need in Jesus. When we doubt ourselves, God sends encouragement, very often in the forms of others, especially those who emit the God-given light that they have received. When darkness obscures our vision, God brightens the gloom with holy light. When we feel afraid, God's Holy Spirit infuses us with curiosity and courage. And so if you remember nothing else today, my friends, you might remember the Pacific football fish. You might remember that light. Remember, too, that God is calling you today and every day to let go of your certainty to pick up your cell phone, to look at the caller ID, to pray and to answer God's call. Answer God's call and receive the light that shines on you today and every day. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of the day, our song of the day.
and bless those who remain on, and especially those who are new members to our council, newly elected at our annual congregational meeting. So first of all, I'd like to call forth those who are going off of council at this point. So that includes Bruce Edling. Melinda Stevens is not here. Come on forward, please. Ethan Proach is not here, but Janet Lefever is. Bruce, here is a, thanks, uh, a certificate of thanksgiving. Looks like I think I gave you two. I'm not giving you Melinda's. Okay, and Janet. We thank you both for the time, the energy, the prayer that you have put into the work that you have done, the good work in leading this congregation. And we pray that as you go from this particular call to what God is calling you to do next, not to say that God won't call you back into this position, but that, that you will be blessed and that you will be energized for what God is calling you to do next. And so I invite the congregation to uh, applause as we affirm. <laughs> And now I would like to call forward those who are currently serving on um, council, including those who were just elected into council. So that includes Ned Kreider and at the earlier service we had a couple of people. So Ned, Marie, Beth is coming forward. Marie, Beth, and Jeannie Gamash form um, the kind of the core of those who are remaining on council. So they have a little bit of an experience, and we have two members who were installed at our early service, and, and Ned joins them, and they were um, um, Wazlas, Jack Wazlaski, and Martha Zeff. And so please include those in your prayers. And so, dear friends, we give thanks for the gift of baptism and for these people, all of whom are one with us in the body of Christ whom we welcome as members into the life and ministry of this congregation, some who are remaining on council, and, 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 other, and others who are new members to the life and ministry of this congregation. And so with the whole church, we thank you for all that you will do and all that you are called to. These people have been elected by the congregation to positions of leadership, and we give thanks for their willingness to serve. In baptism, we are called into the body of Christ and sent to share in the mission of God. We rejoice now that these sisters and brothers will lead us into our common life and in our mutual mission as a congregation. A reading from 1 Corinthians. There are various gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And so, my friends, you have all been elected to positions of leadership and trust in this congregation. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith bear witness to God who gathers us into one together with the whole church. You are to seek to involve all members of this congregation in worship and learning in service and support so that the mission of Jesus Christ is carried out in this place, in this congregation, in the wider church, in this community, and in the whole world. You are to be faithful in your specific area of serving that the Spirit who empowers you may be glorified. You are to be examples of faith acted in love, fostering peace, harmony, and mutual understanding in this congregation. And so on behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask you, will you accept and faithfully carry out the duties of the offices to which you have been elected? If so, respond, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will. I will. And so now, people of God, those of you who are still in your pews, I ask you, will you support these, your elected leaders, and will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all who are baptized? If so, respond, we will, and we ask God to help us. We will, and we ask God to help us. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, you call each and every one of us to certain 
paths that we take, certain journeys that you give us. You give us gifts to carry out the work to which you are calling us. Each one of us, whether elected as a leader of the congregation or as a mutually, a, uh, a mutually blessed member of the congregation serving alongside, seek your light on each and every one of us. Seek your grace and your goodness and seek the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we may do our work in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I now declare you installed as council members of this congregation. Almighty God bless you and direct your days and your deeds in peace that you may be faithful servants of Christ. And the congregation says, Amen. Amen. And so now I invite you to just turn around and as you go back to your seats, the congregation will affirm these prayers. And the I invite you to stand again as you are comfortably able to do as we continue our worship. Let us join together to confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Sisters and brothers, let us join our hearts together in prayer for the church, for all of creation, and for all people in their need. This is a cold morning, Lord, and we pray for all those recovering from this week's winter storms here in our nation. Also for those struggling to recover, to rebuild following natural disasters all over the world. Storms that faded from the headlines weeks and months ago, let them not be forgotten. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for, with thanksgiving for the helpers, Lord. Those who see the need, hear the call, drop what they're doing, and go. Strengthen them, Holy Spirit. Protect them. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for this broken world, this world of strife, hunger, tension, anger, war. Let the bright days of peace come to all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, we pray for the prisoners all over the world, especially in Lancaster County Prison. For people we might know, for the many we do not know. Protect them, Lord, and comfort and lead them. And we pray for all the prison chaplains. Protect them too. Inspire them as they carry your brilliant light behind the walls. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today we pray for, with, with thanksgiving for Harold's recovery, for Debbie's improvement, for reconciliation. As we have been asked, we pray for Sue, for Pastor Marlene, the family and friends of James Lowe, for Jimmy, Richard Landis, for Steve, 
for Susan, the family and friends of Mick Thistle, for Ginny, the family and friends of Linda Brown, for Karen, for Vernon, for Chris, Becky, Ira, Viola, the family and friends of Mary Lou Besser, for Shelby, for Sean, Benny, and Alice, for our service personnel, our homebound members, for Evelyn, Jim, Samantha, Carson, Kathy, Jenny, Martha, Ashley, Tom, and Mary. Are there others for whom we should pray today? Lift up their names. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Pastor Larson as she travels to Africa and back. In our hearts, minds, spirits, we each lay a hand on her shoulder, praying for a good journey. Be in the words she hears and the words she offers. Let her learn, let her teach. Be with her in every moment, inspiring and strengthening, giving light, sharing your light and love, and bring her home rejoicing at the wonders she has seen. We lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and faith. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. As God has given us peace through Christ, so let us pass the peace of Christ to each other. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another.
Gracious God, Jesus is your word made flesh. Jesus brings harmony to the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, therefore, we offer ourselves and all the gifts we have brought this day to offer at your table. Renew us in generosity. Renew our faith in the song of your salvation. May all we present here and all we do each day be a glorious thanksgiving for all you are doing in us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the heights. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the heights. Blessed are you, O holy God. You are the life and light of all. By your powerful word, you created all things. Through the prophets, you called your people to be a light to the nations. Blessed are you for Jesus, your Son. He is your light, shining in our darkness and revealing to us your mercy and might. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it for his disciples to eat, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this. For the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his preaching and healing, his dying and rising, and his promise to come again. We await that day when all the universe will rejoice in your holy and life-giving light. By your Spirit, bless us and this meal, that refreshed with this heavenly food, we may be light for the world, revealing the brilliance of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church both now and forever. Amen. Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to God's table. There is a place for you and food enough for all. Thanks be to God. I now invite you, whether you are at home or here in the congregation in the church, to go ahead and open up your uh, packets or lift up your bread. And as you consume it, remember that this is the body of Christ given for you. Next, go ahead and consume the grape juice or the wine that you have. Remember that this is the blood of Christ shed for you.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, for these gifts of bread and wine. Use them to work in us all that is pleasing to you. Help us share your love and grace in this world. Amen. Amen. And now, people of God, receive this blessing. God who leads you in paths of righteousness, who rejoices over you, who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in this time, day, and every day. Amen. Just a few announcements that I have for today. The first is that next week, of course, is the Super Bowl, and I'm not just referring to the athletic competition, but we have a little bit of a competition that happens here at Zion. We'll be setting up tables, with, uh, one on either side of the, of the sanctuary, and they will each represent one of the two competing teams in the later um, athletic game, and you will get to vote for your favorite team using cans of soup. You can certainly bring in more than one. Each can will represent a vote or a point for your team, and we'll see how good Zion is at predicting the winner of the athletic competition. So we'll have a lot of fun, and we'll feed people as well. As well, next Sunday, we will be um, remembering our Boy Scouts, and we'll be blessing them. And so we have cards uh, that you can write on um, to be given to them uh, with words of support, love, and care. This, of course, has been a difficult time during COVID for them as well, but they have continued to serve and continue to meet in, in different and various ways. And so let's encourage them. Those cards may be found on the kiosk and on the communications table. There is a vessel for receiving them. And finally, um, as I mentioned earlier, of course, it's uh, uh, Verna Young is at a garden spot, and her address may be obtained by calling the office. And um, this time next week when you gather, I will be in a plane somewhere between here and uh, Tanzania, actually between here and Qatar. Um, I will cherish and um, covet your prayers for myself, for the group that I will be um, traveling with, and for all that we come into contact with. And so um, that is just a word to you um, regarding the prayers that, that are needed for support. But today, uh, on your way in, you probably noticed a couple of suitcases over by the circular table. They are collecting goods, and those suitcases will stay in place until Thursday of this week, um, at which time I really need to get my act together and be packing those and pyramids that uh, Karen Gordon and I will be selecting today to go to Empata and to other churches in the Kandi Diocese. And so your gifts, both of cash and also of the items listed in your bulletin, and if you receive um, the midweek electronic uh, fast fat, uh, not fast facts, but a news flash from me, you know that there are other items in there um, that we can use and take uh, with us. And so all of those will be um, presented to the Kandi Diocese, the things that are designated for Empata will go directly to the church that we are in partnership with. In addition, I have put together a photo album, and there are a few more pictures we put in it, but there is space for you to write greetings on the fly flaps, both front and back of the book itself, and also some colorful cards that are on the table. So simple notes are wonderful, just letting them know that you love them, that Jesus loves them, that, that Jesus brings us together, whatever it is on your heart today. And uh, there are also stickers, so you can also put stickers on those cards. They, uh, the, the churches in Africa, and especially in Pada, treasure our prayers and the connection that they have with us. So let's strengthen that connection by letting them know that it's not just the pastor, but all of you who go with me this week. And so those uh, are found on your way out. Please go ahead and take a look and uh, write your notes. Those are the only announcements that I know of this week. Any others that we should be lifting up? Seeing none, I invite you to stand as we sing our final song for worship. This has got a lot of uh, male-female participation. The first verses, for instance, the guys go, You are holy. And the ladies go, You are holy. And 
etc., etc. Then we get to the chorus, and that's even better because we sing two different things at the same time. <laughs> so the men are singing, I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy. Meanwhile, the ladies are singing, You are Lord of Lords, you are King of Kings, you are mighty God, Lord of everything, etc., etc.